So over to you, Rob. Thanks. Okay, thanks Penny and thank you for the invitation. I'm just going to have to pause for a moment. I need to kiss my two-year-old daughter goodnight. Excuse me. And that's lovely. And while he's doing that, I, I do apologise. I didn't in introduce Rob properly. Now, Rob is a math science teacher at Cruzo College in Bendigo. And uh, he's, I, I don't think he has been there for very long, maybe just this year. So we started to introduce some of his ideas um, just in the last five weeks or so. Oh yes, oh AJ, yes. What, kissing his daughter um, good night? She, she certainly couldn't do that in a classroom, could you? My kids went to the school I taught at and, and they were in um, secondary school and believe me, they just ran every time they saw me anywhere in the school yard. So Rob's back and his daughter's happy. Okay, over to you, Rob. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thanks, Benny. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, I haven't done this for a little while, and I kind of put this together at the last minute, so I hope it makes sense. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present three different topics, and I'm going to be talking about each of the topics is going to be about how technology can personalise learning. So what I might do is I might pause at the end of each little topic and give people the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, as uh, Penny mentioned, I'm at Crusoe College, which is in Bendigo at the moment. Um, I was at Castlemaine North Primary School before that, and uh, before that I was actually an alternate coach uh, for part of the for the Loddon Mallee region. So I've had a fair bit to do with technology uh, in the last few years. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you'll see is a carryover from the work that I did um, with another teacher at Castlemaine North. Uh, but uh, pretty much everything that I'm going to present is happening now at Crusoe. So basically what I'm talking about, even though I'm talking a lot about technology, in, in effect I'm talking about personalised learning. And I want to be quite specific around uh, what personalised learning means. So personalised learning means that uh, learners are central. So as much as possible they are making um, the decisions about what they learn, how they learn it, where they learn it, when they learn it. Uh, the second point is that technology is obviously a key enabler of personalised learning and you'll see from what I present that uh, a lot of this wouldn't be possible without technology. The third point is that it's about lifelong learning, so it's not simply about teaching content but a lot of the skills that are necessary for people to uh, learn and relearn in the 21st century I hope you'll see coming through our work. And finally it's about communi uh, communities of collaboration so that people um, are not working in isolation but they're using other people to learn and hopefully that will come through as well. So um, this picture is of at my last school and it's a presentation of some data and even though it's re um, it is uh, reading you can see that um, pretty much in every classroom every teacher would have this challenge. On the left hand side you've got the kids in red and each one of those squares represents a student and uh, you can see that about a third of the kids are well below the expected level, about a third in the dark blue are well above and uh, the ones in the middle are about a third as well. And so the, the big challenge for every teacher is how do you uh, cater for such a span of student abilities and interests in your classroom? And so that's where my belief in personalised learning uh, has come from. I'm pretty sure pretty much every teacher would see uh, this kind of span in their classroom. So particularly in maths we found that this was a difficulty that we needed to overcome and we thought that uh, part of personalised le uh, personalized learning is differentiated learning and um, differentiated learning means that you're providing students with respectful tasks, tasks that encourage uh, deep understanding, that they're flexible grouping so it's not streaming, that students are able to, to mix and match which groups that they're in and that the assessment of their learning is ongoing. And you can differentiate by altering the content, which is what they learn, the process, how they learn it, the products, what they produce to show their learning, and the learning environment, be that physical or virtual. And this is done according to uh, the student's readiness, uh, their interests, and their learning profile in terms of whether they prefer to learn uh, via auditory or visual or kinesthetic. And so this is an old slide that um, 
that I came across when I was doing my uh, diploma of education and see old zone of proximal development, trying to get students working in a place where they need a little bit of assistance from the teacher. And I think in most classrooms well, we've got a problem with students who are outside that zone of proximal development. The task is either too hard and they're frustrated or it's too easy and they're bored. So one of the ways we have tried to address this uh, first at Castlemaine North and now at Crusoe is we've set up a website uh, that has a whole range of videos which provide students instruction at their point of need. Uh, you can feel free to go to the address which is on the screen, I might put it in the chat as well. And feel free to have a look around. I might take you on a bit of a tour, let's see if this works. Okay. Can everybody see that? If uh, you'd like to give Rob a smiley face, just underneath uh, the participant window is this four icons. The one on the left with the smiley face, if you drop that down and, and you can give him a sign that it's come through okay. Beautiful. All right. I'll try and make this as brief as possible. So this is our website. This is the Global Maths website. And uh, if you scroll down, whoops, you can see a number of buttons. And these are all split up into topics, uh, parts of the Australian curriculum. So on the left-hand side in the dark orange, you've got number and place value. You've got fractions and decimals, money and financial mathematics. Uh, it's very incomplete. So if you're going to have a look around, I suggest you look at the number and place value as the, uh, the ones that we're doing at the moment that would have the most content. Each of these letters represents a different year level. So uh, E represents grade 4, F grade 5 and so on and so forth. And what we do is we provide students with tasks for each topic uh, at each of these or as many of these uh, levels as we possibly can. So for example, if I click on number and place value H, which is year 7, I will see a number of instructional videos that provide me with the content and the task that I need at that particular level. So for example, if I scroll down to factors and multiples, so this is what year seven should be learning uh, about factors and multiples. Similarly with adding and subtracting positive and negative numbers. Uh, they're not the world's best videos, but feel free to have a look. So basically what this allows students to do is it allows you within a single classroom to have students working at multiple levels and the students are the ones who are making the choice about which level they go into rather than being streamed in. Interesting, ah, we're back. Uh, interesting, Penny, you mentioned uh, Salman Khan. He was actually the part of the inspiration behind uh, this. And I'll go into why this is different from Salman Khan's work if you're, not if you're familiar with the Khan Academy. So really this is um, some scenes today actually from uh, a typical classroom where this is in place. And you can see that the students, the thing I like about this way of working is that the students are choosing what they learn. So it's not the teacher saying you're in this level, you need to be doing this task. The students are in charge of deciding which level they're working at. If the video is too difficult or the task is too difficult, they're free to move down a level or if it's too easy, they're free to move up a level. It enables them to work where they want to. So you can see in the photograph on the right hand side that you've got um, students there in mixed ability groups. Within this shot here you've got um, students working everywhere from grade 6 up to year 9. Uh, you've also got students who are choosing how they want to learn. So you can see in this shot you've got some students who are working with pen and paper, you've got some students on a laptop, you've got some students on a desktop. In the bottom left hand corner um, you can see that there are a couple of students who are um, using the technology to access an instructional video. So it means that I'm free to be able to help students with uh, at their point of need. So the videos don't replace my teaching but they augment it. They buy me some time so that I'm able to say okay go and watch the video and I'll catch up with you in 15 minutes and we'll see you know what, what it is that you need help with or what it is that you didn't understand. But the thing I, again I have to reinforce, the thing I like about this is that the power of the learning really is in the hands of the students.
Now, Salman Khan was mentioned, and um, and the Khan Academy, and I want to point out one of the big differences between uh, an instructional video and the types of videos that we're producing. These videos don't just present the content, but they also present the performance of understanding that we're asking our students to do. So each of our students, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of a blog, and each of our students records their understanding of topics on um, on their blog. So what happens is that students uh, uh, have the freedom to choose how they show their understanding of a particular topic and as long as it ends up on their blog that's fine and you can imagine that with technology this opens a whole range of ways of showing your understanding that weren't previously available because you had to record it in an exercise book. So you can see in the top left hand corner uh, one of the students has created an array and he's actually showing the distributive law with counters. And on the bottom left, you can see that a student has made a card game to show his understanding of the index laws. Now, uh, one of Crusoe's uh, priorities at the moment is to try and get mobile learning happening uh, as a way of using mobiles for, um, for positive, for learning rather than um, for not learning, I guess. Uh, you can see the students here, what um, they're able to do is they ins have installed a WordPress app and they're able to, with their mobile, simply take a snapshot of a model or whatever it is that they've created and upload it to their blog instantly. So it makes that collecting the evidence of their learning very easy for them. It's not necessary for the students to have uh, a mobile, but it certainly makes it easier for them. They're still able to do that through a netbook. So the maths program not just provides the content that they need to learn, but it also provides them with an open-ended task where they get to choose how they show their learning and the technology really supports that. Another way that we've used mobile technology is to make it really easy for students to access the, the task. I've given you a really brief look at the um, website and it can be a little bit confusing to try and find the correct task. So what we've done on the bottom right hand side here in the photograph, you can see that we've produced sort of la laminated um, sheets that outline what the task is, they give it a name and they have a QR code. And so what a student does is they simply walk up with their mobile, they look at the task that they think that they're able to do, they scan it and that takes them through to the instructional video really quickly so that students are able to very quickly access the instruction that they need. So that's another way that we've used mobile technology to really support that learning by making it really easy for students to access these instructional videos which are really key to, to this way of working. Okay, did anybody have any questions about how we're teaching mathematics? This, sort of, this is sort of the end of the, uh, the first bit. Rob, it's Penny here. I mentioned Sal Khan earlier on sort of a little bit in jest because I think uh, if you'd got on the, the ball a little bit earlier than he did, you'd be a millionaire by now because this work is fabulous. So well done. Uh, now we've got someone else put up their hand. We've got AJ. Would you like to take the mic, AJ? Yeah, my mind's just gone blank. Oh my gosh, what was I going to say? Um, Oh, okay, so they've got their work on their blog. How do you provide feedback to them and are you collecting their work uh, in another place or space for reporting and evidencing um, or on their blog is going to be, and does that transfer with them? Will that grow and develop with them? Uh, thanks for the question, AJ. Um, yeah, pretty much the blog is the main way that we're collecting evidence of their learning. Uh, they still have maths books and they still work in their maths books, uh, but it gives them uh, another option in which to show their understanding. So they've still got the work there, but because it's up on their blog, that means that it's more easily accessible to us. And the idea is that, yeah, it's going to be an ongoing, um, an ongoing record of their learning and we're hoping that it's not going to be just in maths. Uh, we also use it in science and um, I would like to imagine that more teachers would get on board and they'll see this as a logical successor to the exercise book be just because it enables students more choices in the way that they show their work. They're no longer restricted to something that they can write down in an exercise book. They're also able to um, 
you know, choose anything that can be done digitally. It might be a voice recording, it might be a video. So really what we're looking at is the blogs as the main way of, of um, recording their learning. I should also say that um, a lot of them, um, a lot of this work wouldn't be possible without team teaching. I don't know if you noticed in the previous photo, but we have open learning spaces and Katie is one of, she's in the room at the moment and um, I team teach with her and you know, having her support is really crucial to, to this working because it just makes that, um, that differentiation easier. If I can say to Katie, okay, you, you take these tasks and I'll take these, these tasks, then it's, um, it's a lot easier to be able to, to handle rather than just me on my own. If I've got five different tasks happening, it can become quite overwhelming to try and answer questions about five different tasks. Would anyone else like to uh, take the microphone and ask Rob a question about the maths before he moves on to the next part of his talk? Feel free just to grab the mic and ask anything that comes to mind. How do you handle yes, um, cheats? Oh, uh, okay. Keith, how do you handle uh, uh, like cheating or those people who are uh, technology or those kids who are technology averse? Uh, with the kids who don't like using technology, um, uh, they're still able to do a physical model or do it on their in their exercise book. I just support them to be able to put it onto their blog. Um, occasionally I'll do it for them if, if need be. Uh, we want to get away from that. It is still part of the Victorian curriculum that students are uploading their work. Uh, and with particularly if they have a mobile, it's really easy. It only takes seconds. Um, but yeah, I think um, the fact that it, it, the blog in itself is just the place where the evidence is stored rather than it being the way that they show their understanding. So if they want to do it all in their exercise book, that's what we're all, that's what personalised learning is about, giving them that opportunity. I think because a lot of it, in terms of the cheating, I think because a lot of the tasks we're getting them to do are uh, video based, uh, require them to show their understanding in um, in creative ways. So if you have a look at the videos, I ask them to do, uh, for example, stories that describe um, multiplication and division of positive and negative numbers. It's really easy to see that if they're cheating or not. So it's not a simple copy and paste sort of task that I'm asking them to do. And so that's been done deliberately because we're getting them to show their understanding in creative ways and we're getting them to choose the way in which they show their understanding. It makes cheating that much harder. And because you're in the classroom, you can tell what's going on as well. You know if a student has done that because you've actually seen them do that. Uh, Simon, would you like to take the mic now, thanks? Okay, yep, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Simon. Simon. Okay, good. Yeah, um, now, what was my question? A oh, um, couple of questions. Can we view the kids' blog somewhere just to have a look? Um, on top of that, how do you, how do you handle your summative um, testing at the end. This is all beautiful and I love what you're doing in um, getting kids to express their learning in various ways, but, but do they have to then still suffer a poor old test at the end of all this and how do they cope with that? <laughs> that's, um, that's something we're still talking about, Simon. Um, uh, in terms of viewing the blogs, they're password protected. So if you're still interested, you can email me. Um, I think Penny's got my details, and I can provide you with a password. Um, uh, because of issues with you know the community and, and perceptions about cyber safety and those sorts of things, I've got sort of things in place that prevent people from outside being able to view them. Um, in terms of how it fits in with testing, that's a really good question, and we're still grappling with it. Um, one of the teachers that we're working with has offered to sort of um, support it with more skills based work. Um, uh, it's something that we're still getting our heads around. I, I guess we would describe this at Crusoe as a bit of a trial, um, but I would like this to be the, the, the important part of their assessment rather than going back to the on demand tests and things like that. So I don't have a, a clear answer. We're, that's still something that we're discussing in, in a teaching team. All right, anyone else have any more questions about maths before Rob moves on to, I'm not sure what's next, 
uh, well, whether it's literacy or science, but anyone else want to take the mic before we move on? I think we're right, uh, Rob. People might come up with some more questions anyway during the presentation. Thanks. No drivers, Penny. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is um, how we've used technology to personalise the literacy. And this all came about uh, because of a um, the conversation I had with a colleague of mine at Castlemaine North Primary School and we were talking about why why do people write, why do we teach students to write and why have I guess humans learned to write and we came up with the conclusion that it's, it's really about communication and I think that's something that we we need to do better in schools. We get students to write but their audience, the people that they're communicating with is often very limited and I think that's one way that technology can, can really um, have a quick win in terms of being able to provide students with an authentic audience. So here's an example of uh, writing for an authentic audience. This is a student at Castlemaine North Primary School last year and they went to Sovereign Hill and uh, the teacher asked them to write their top 10 tips for attending Sovereign Hill Camp and uh, this student has written it on her blog. Now this particular blog is hooked up to a Twitter account and what it does is it takes her blog post and posts it out on Twitter and because it was about Sovereign Hill, the education part of Sovereign Hill uh, actually picked up on it and retweeted it to, to all their followers. And so I noticed this and I ended up having a conversation with the woman who runs the education department at Sovereign Hill and uh, George's blog post about the top Sovereign Hill top 10 camp tips ended up on their website. So this is a fantastic example of how we can get students to be writing for a real uh, audience. So why did we choose writing? This is, uh, we chose writing as our way to start uh, collaborating globally with other schools. Why do we choose writing? Well, because all schools teach writing all the time. Often when you're trying to do global collaboration, one of the difficulties is that the topic doesn't fit with, um, with what other schools are doing. But everybody's teaching writing all the time. Uh, writing is really about uh, simple technology. You don't require any sorts of uh, video cameras or anything like that. Um, it's broad enough to encompass many directions, so a science report can be writing, a uh, persuasive piece can be writing, a, a history assignment can be writing. And the research around technology and writing uh, is really strong, so um, research shows that when kids use uh, technology for writing they write more, they write more often, they make fewer errors and they make more revisions. And that's particularly true for lower end students. So what we did is we created the Writers Club and I'll put that link up in the chat for you to go and have a look at. The Writers Club is a collection of or a community of bloggers and at the moment we're up to over 500 students. They're spread across 12 different schools in five different countries. And I, because of time I might leave the web tour out but you can go and have a look at your leisure. And so the Writers Club came from the idea that usually when uh, classes interact from different parts of the world, they interact via class blogs. And so a student who wants to work with another student in a different country has to go via the class blog and the, uh, the um, teacher is the mediator or the teachers of the two class blogs are the mediators of those contacts. So the student can't really work with another student without that teacher giving the okay. What we've created though is a community of bloggers where students are free to be able to choose uh, which blogs they're interested in and um, which blogs they're going to follow and interact with. So here's an example. Um, at the top we have a student from Castlemaine North who's left a comment and the reply is from uh, the, student, the author who is a student from Drysdale near Geelong. And then a student from Lahore in Pakistan has jumped into the conversation. And then you've got a different student from Castlemaine North. And then the, the author from Drysdale has replied. And all of this has happened without the teacher even knowing about it. So this is something that's happened spontaneously. So this is really about putting the, the power of the global interactions in the hands of the students. Now here's another good example of something happening that's not being mediated by teachers. So this is a um, uh, 
discussion that's happened on the site. Uh, a student from Hong Kong has uh, talked about some good authors for girls and then you've had a couple of different students from the United States jump in and then a student from Australia has, has put in her suggestions as well. And so this whole conversation has happened without any knowledge of the teacher. Here's a really nice story. This is a fantastic um, piece of writing that was done by a student in Lahore in Pakistan and she wrote this, this uh, really emotive piece about the most beautiful person on earth to her and it ended up being her baby cousin which was lovely but what happened next was really interesting because uh, one of the students at Castlemaine North read it and then said well would it be okay if I wrote a story like this about my, my grandfather who just passed away and they had this fantastic conversation online and you think this has all happened again without teachers, this has all happened spontaneously would this have happened without technology? This student at Castlemaine North has been inspired by a student in Pakistan to write about her grandfather who just passed away. For me this is just incredible, this is the stuff that we're, we're aiming for, it's really putting the hands, putting the power of these interactions in the hands of the students. I noticed Katie answering the, the question about moderation, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So really what we're aiming to do is to make it really, really easy for other schools to work globally. So we're lowering the barrier for entry into global learning. And how are we doing that? Well, first of all, that um, participation in the Rise Club is based on passion. So you don't have to have all your students on there. You can have one student in your class, ten students, or the whole lot of them. And if you're choosing students who are just passionate about writing, then you're not as worried about them doing the wrong thing because they're engaged in something that they're passionate about. Uh, students and teachers can contribute what they want, any sort of writing, they can contribute when they want it so they don't have to post every week or every month or every term, they can do it as often or as infrequently as they like. They can do it from wherever they have an internet connection and any sort of writing is fine however the students like it. Because it's writing and we're all um, do it teaching writing, there are no curriculum changes. As soon as, a, um, as soon as a person signs up and starts posting, they have an instant global audience of over 500. And because they're blogs, there's no particular technology requirements. It's pretty easy on the, um, on the bandwidth. And so it makes it really easy for uh, schools who perhaps don't have a high level of technology to participate. And so this can then lead on to other sorts of interactions. So once kids start reading each other's work and start going, oh yeah, I know that student, then you've got a reason to do things like have the Skype conversations. In the top left hand story you can see kids from Castlemaine talking to some fellow authors in Mexico. Uh, on the top right and bottom right you can see some of our older students and in the bottom right our younger students who are asking uh, the authors in Shanghai in China about some of the writing that they've done and in the bottom left you can see uh, our class talking to the uh, school in Lahore in Pakistan. Uh, if you're out of school or you want to be involved in some way, uh, the globalschool.net forward slash writers club. Uh, we've got an email address and we've also got a Twitter account. So at the start I mentioned that all the student writing gets pushed out to Twitter and so that gives them an even bigger audience. So if you want to read some student writing you can follow TGS Writers Club. That's the end of my part about the literacy. Were there any questions about the Writers Club and, and how we use the global collaboration to um, to personalise literacy. Rob, it's Penny here. I um, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see what's going on, um, and I was just wondering whether the maths overlaps with your Writers Club. Uh, do you have children from around the world solving? math problems or that, or, or that might come into the science conversations as well. And also if there are teachers here who work um, in, in higher ed or in the learn local sector, I'm, I'm sure they have students, well I know everyone has students who need to develop their literacy skills. Do you invite um, older people to come in and have conversations as well? I know you do it with the scientists but do you encourage that with your writers club as well? 
Um, we've actually had, we've got an ex-teacher who's in Marimbula in New South Wales and he very generously gives up his time to comment on the students' writing. I'll just find his profile. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically anybody who wants an audience is going to be able to get something from the Writers' Club. Um, I'm just finding his profile so you can have a look at what he's been doing. There he is. I'd really encourage you to have a look at um, the Writers' Club in terms of how it it, um, it enables students to find each other's work really easily. So this is an ex-teacher and he's um, a part of our group, but we're certainly open to any sort of audience that we can provide for our, our students to be able to to give them an authentic reason to write. Uh, we don't have any overlap with the maths at the moment. Um, that is something that's sort of clicking away at the back of my head, but I think I've got my fingers in so many pies at the moment that um, that I might just leave that for now and, and I'll concentrate on, on doing that collaboration within the Writers' Club and also within the science that we're doing. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, AJ has a, a question for you, Rob. Um, there's been some discussion recently in Twitter circles and various places around schools and such about the skills that students are losing because of the integration of technology and especially when it comes to this writing side of things. So um, are you finding that students, given the opportunity to use the technology and have it more regularly, say with their writing, um, you quoted that their, the work that they were producing was of a higher quality and they were able to draft more and edit more. Um, so that all sounds promising to me, but are there any skills that they're losing that we should be concerned about? That I know parents are worried that kids are losing the handwriting skills, that kids are learn losing their belief, parents believe that the kids are losing their spelling skills. Are you seeing any evidence of this? Because you've been in this a lot longer than I have and these are the sorts of things that when I try to integrate technology into my classrooms, there's a lot of hesitation because it feels like I'm trying to throw out the old skills and the old abilities. Yeah, I think I've answered the um, the handwriting question so many times and I'm not sure I ever give an answer that's going to, to please everyone. Um, I'm a research scientist so I really believe in using research in education and the uh, the stuff that I quoted is actually from John Hattie's uh, work. It's actually an, a meta-analysis of, um, of technology in, in education so all that stuff has been backed up by multiple studies into, and I haven't seen any studies that suggest that students uh, lose any handwriting skills. I think by the time they get to sort of grade five and six, uh, which is how we initially started the Writers' Club, um, I don't think it has any effect on uh, their handwriting at all. And I think that's been borne out by what we've seen in uh, things like NAPLAN tests. So the NAPLAN test is a handwritten, I think I can't remember how long they write for, 45 minutes or an hour. You know, it's really traditional pen and pencil type of thing. And at Castlemaine North, I mean, I would have said we were one of the most prolific users of technology for a couple of years there in the state. And our, if it was detrimental to their handwriting, you would expect our NAPLAN scores to have gone down, but in fact, they, um, they stayed steady or even slightly increased. So I haven't seen, even though I think people believe that this is happening, I have not seen any concrete evidence that it's, that it's happening. I've only seen evidence that supports using technology for writing. And I've, in you know, in terms of the testing that we did at Castlemaine North, there was no evidence that it had any adverse effect on doing something like that plan. Robert Penny here. When you're when you're um, encouraging the kids to write, do you check their work before it goes public? And do you find that many of the kids are using the, the sort of text language abbreviation and do you ask them to change it or, or do you let it go out like that? Um, it, we really leave that up to the, the teachers who are um, involved. Uh, for example, I don't have any specifications. If, it's, if a school uh, in the United States who's on the Writers Club is happy for text language to go out, that's up to them. Um, when we were teaching literacy, um, we had certain specific guidelines around what we would accept as being put up. We really didn't have a problem with that. Um, 
and I know that's something that, uh, that people tend to bring up, but the people that we had on the Riders Club, because we only had passionate riders, we tended to see people using you know, a proper form of writing. So it was, it was never an issue with us, and the Riders Club's been going three years now, so... No, is the short answer. I think, you know, it's it's not an issue that we're seeing. Thanks, Rob. And we've got a question from Chris, uh, Shambles Bureau over in Thailand. Chris, did you want to take the microphone or I will I just read your question out? Have you got a mic tonight? Oh, okay. So Chris is asking Rob whether... Oh, I've got to find your, your question again. Excuse me for a minute. It's about SMS. Uh, what are your views, Rob, on SMS killing long form writing? Um, my background is not in uh, literacy. I should. I wonder if Simone's listening. She could probably jump in and and talk a little bit about that. Um, I mean, I haven't seen it, and I think this is why I'm a big fan of blogs. Is that I think really blogs are about that long form of writing and I really would prefer that students are writing you know, proper pieces rather than um, really short pieces of text. So um, I haven't seen any evidence of it in the, in the schools that I've worked at. I don't think it's, it's been an issue, particularly for the ones who are passionate. For the ones that struggle it might be, but um, if you have a look at the, um, the writing that's on the Writers Club, I don't think you'll find that that's the issue. Okay, and we have a question from Simon. Over to you, Simon. Yeah, more a comment. Um, I have taught in the secondary system for, um, you know, in digitally rich environments, kids one on one with laptops for, you know, like 10 years. And you just, you don't see that drop in literacy and handwriting. I'm not sure what the um, you know, research will so tell you, but basically nowadays kids develop a multitude of literacies. They're digitally literate, so they'll use their shorthand, you know, text messaging, but when they have to, they rise to the occasion and they write properly within their, you know, the limits of their own literacy. And, you know, these kids that are digitally, uh, digitally literate, you know, summarising things on their, their phones, they're still getting up to VCE and doing well, so really they're learning a multitude of skills that maybe we were never, you know, we never had to when we were at school. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I, I, as I said, I mean, I'm a research scientist, and if somebody shows me a um, uh, a study that shows that there is a catastrophic decline in students' writing from the use of technology, then I will certainly take that into consideration. But if you look at John Hattie's work, and he's, you know, it's not one study, it's uh, you know, dozens of studies done around the world with kids at lots of different ages, then um, and it's all positive. It's it's the most positive that comes out of the use of technology is when it's used in writing. And as Simone said, I think it's about teacher expectations. If you if you have high expectations and you say this is what I expect from you and you enforce it, then you know that's what the students are going to produce. More, I think that that is a much bigger impact on the quality of student writing rather than whether what they've used to create the writing with. And that's that's a good point, isn't it? That we that we do raise the bar and and teach the students that there are more formal ways of writing, um, but that the way we write um, can vary according to the context that we're writing in. So. Good point. Uh, now, I think we need to move on to the science. This is a bit I'm really looking forward to hearing about because I want to jump into this project myself. So, uh, Rob, I think we're ready for the next bit. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Penny. Uh, okay. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about now is how we get students to connect with people outside of their school. And you can see I've got a slide here that I actually used previously. And this is typically the way that schools um, get students to connect with, um, with um, other parties outside of the school grounds. So you can see here that there's a, there's a whiteboard at the front and the teacher's the one who's in control and the students are all sitting and listening and they're taking turns and speaking. And um, while I think that certainly has its place, we were trying to aim for something different. So we were trying to aim 
for going from the teacher initiated contact to really the students initiating the contact with those outside parties. We wanted, instead of the teacher saying, well, this is what the interaction is going to be about, we wanted the student saying, this is what I need, this is what I want it to be about. We wanted that contact to go from episodic, like we're just going to do a one-off, to an ongoing, so that students always have the opportunity to be able to reach out. And going from a narrow focus uh, to a broad focus, so instead of, you know, this is this person's going to talk about you know, Antarctica, that, that there's going to be a broad focus that's really based on what the students need. And to go from a whole class experience where everybody's sitting and listening to a more one-on-one -on -one personalised experience. So how can technology support personalised learning? Uh, what we did at Castlemaine North was we invited students to come up with their own question. If they could investigate anything, what would they be interested in investigating? And you can see on the screen we've got a, a, um, a multitude of questions that our kids came up with. Some wanted to find out how scientists work. Some wanted to find out what animal pop what affects animal populations. Uh, the boys wanted to find out what was the most effective way to kick an AFL football. Can you teach science through a computer game? What features of a toy car? You'll see a strong science theme through this. So how do you as teachers be able to support so many really diverse questions going on? So what we did is we came up with the idea of virtual experts. These were people who were experts in their field who were willing to support the students in their own personal inquiries. So you can see that there are multiple, a multitude of people here and all of these people were able to work both online through asynchronous blogging, uh, commenting on students' blogs, that they're, the work that they're putting up online, but also being making themselves available at certain times for them to be able to talk with the students face to face. So I'll go a little bit more into how that actually worked. Okay, I'm not sure if you can read this, but I'll summarise it. This is from um, a conversation that occurred in a forum and the, uh, the person at the top is a, uh, a molecular biologist in Melbourne and she's commented on uh, uh, the student's experiment and, and asked her a few questions and you can see that the student has, has replied and, and given her a link to her blog where she's got her experimental results. But then what happened was really interesting. Um, the student then says, I'd like to be able to speak to you on Skype, this is when I'm free. And the, the, um, the scientist says, yep, okay, I'll be home on Thursday and, and we'll work out a time. So this has happened, this has been uh, mediated, not by the teacher, but it's been student driven. The student has decided, I need help, so I'm going to reach out to a scientist and organise a Skype chat and, and get the assistance that I need. So here's how it played out. So for example, this is Geoffrey Hosford. He's a biomechanist in Melbourne and he actually wrote a book called The Science of Kicking. And here he's showing a couple of students and me how to be able to use video to analyse uh, the kicking of a football. So he's showing us how to video from front on to get the accuracy and side on to be able to get the technique. Uh, this is Crystal Evans, she was in the forum conversation that I just showed you. She's an immunologist in Melbourne and she's working with a student here who's got some questions about the design of her experiment to find out which is the most effective washing powder. This is Tim Moore, he's an electrical engineer in Newcastle and here he's working with uh, three of our boys and helping them to figure out what design is going to make the toy car go down an incline the fastest. Uh, this is Chris Armashaw, he's a chemist in Florida in the United States and he's working with a student and helping her to be able to solve her problems with chromatography. This is Pat Keneally, he's a software engineer in Canberra and he's working with a couple of students who were uh, trying to get a computer game started to show their understanding of a particular scientific concept and he's talking to them about how you get storyboarding happening. I knew I can see the questions coming up, and they're, they're the questions I always get. I'll just ca uh, get to the end of this. Uh, Sarah Royce is a biology teacher in Bendigo, which is uh, local to Castlemaine, and here she's working with a group of students around um, discussing the results from a field trip. So you can see that they're working either one on one or in really small groups. And this is Jeremy Forbes. He's a history student in Castlemaine, and he's helping a student uh, trying to make a um, uh, catapult that is um, medieval in design. So these virtual experts, how are they different from a guest speaker? Well, 
uh, the initiator of the contact with a guest speaker is the teacher, but with the virtual experts, as you've seen, it's the student who's initiating that content. The, the contact. The content is the speaker's expertise for a guest speaker, whereas the content, the thing that they're talking about with a virtual expert, is what the student needs to know. Uh, it can happen any time for the virtual expert uh, because it's asynchronous; it doesn't have to happen at a particular time, and uh, the place can be anywhere. It can be uh, multimodal, so it doesn't, as I've said, it doesn't have to be uh, purely over Skype. It can be uh, that they're using forums, messaging, blogs, those sorts of things. Uh, the participants are single st uh, student or small groups, and students can actually work with multiple experts rather than just a single speaker. And we want them working in an ongoing capacity with our students rather than in a one-off, uh, one-off occasion. So what we've done now is we've taken that and we're uh, the next step in the project is to try and make it global. So uh, what we've got is virtual scientists at Crusoe. So we've got a site now. I'll put the uh, website in the chat. So what we've got is we've got a group of scientists who have um, kindly dis uh, offered to give up their time and work online with our students. And um, our students put up their, um, the results of their experiment and they're able to get feedback from real scientists. And so the scientists are able to push their thinking and, and help them get a, a better understanding of scientific method and how to interpret results and how to present information and, and things like that. You can see in the bottom right hand corner we've also got the Skype thing happening. So in the bottom right you can see uh, some of our student scientists working with uh, Mel Thompson who is a, um, a molecular biologist at Deakin University in Geelong and the bottom left they're working with Tim Moore who is the electrical engineer in Newcastle. So again uh, the big thing that we're trying to get here is that we've got students who are initiating the, con the contact and that the power of those contacts is with the students rather than with the teacher. Uh, if you want to be involved in any of these sorts of things, uh, the globalschool.net is where we host all these projects, the Maths, the Writers Club and the, uh, the Science Site. Uh, I've given the addresses for the Writers Club and the Science Site are up here. I've got my own blog which is at spalia.com. Uh, my email address is there and I occasionally tweet at spalia. Um, yeah, I think I hope you've get, gotten um, an impression of how we use technology to really put the power of learning in the hands of the students. So it's giving the students the opportunity to decide who they're making contact with, where they're getting the help, when they're doing it, um, you know, the, the topics that they're doing in maths, how they're showing their understanding, all those sorts of things. And um, I can only encourage you when you're thinking about using technology to think about who has the power of the technology in that in those situations. Thanks Penny and I'm happy to take any questions on any of those topics. Fabulous presentation Rob, I, I just think it's wonderful. Uh, now we have a question from AJ if you'd like to take the mic. Um, Rob, I've sort of chatted with you in different areas before or just you know alongside you in various things. You seem to have been doing this quite some time, far longer than I've been trying to do it as well. Um, do you get a feel now for the schools that are ready to take on these type of activities and this type of learning? Do you feel that they they have to come to a point and an understanding and an acceptance within the community, both teachers, staff and students for this to be effective or do you just um, go for it wherever you might land? Uh, I think I've been burned by going for it um, when the school hasn't been ready. Um, I think the, the most important people in the school are the leadership and if the leadership aren't on board with what you're doing it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, so I think I know that at Crusoe while there are uh, large hurdles that need to be overcome, we're in a very low socioeconomic area and we have issues with students who have really negative uh, views around technology because um, of the, the failure, well not the failure but the um, inadequacies of the netbook program that's happened there. Um, 
I know that the leadership are behind me. So that I think that's really important. If the leadership aren't behind you, then I, th I think oh, you're almost wasting your time. Um, I was wondering if Simone could actually t talk about that because she's had um, similar sorts of um, experiences with um, the leadership and whether they're supportive or not. So um, yeah, I think if, if you've got the leadership behind you, you'll be right. I think you can overcome pretty much anything. Just wondering, Simone, um, do you have a comment about that, or, or would you like to take the mic and tell us what the were there problems with the netbook program uh, before? I'm not sure if Simone's got a microphone. She was actually the person that I did um, most of the work that you've seen with at Castlemaine North. Um, uh, the the uh, at Castlemaine North, we had a really successful. Uh, netbook program, but um, we didn't always have the support that we required to be able to uh, use the technology in the ways that we wanted to. Uh, at, at Crusoe, we, we've got the opposite problem where we've got we've got a lot of support, but we've got a lot of um, problems in terms of, of infrastructure and, and uh, policies and, and things like that. So, yeah, I think that I haven't come across the perfect school yet, but. I think um, having that leadership support is is really important, and that the technology is not seen as as being used for its own sake, but it's part of a broader push in the school to achieve something. So when you come to Crusoe and you see the big sign and it says um, personal, uh, what does it say? It says personal relationships, personalised learning. So if you can frame technology in that way, then it, it's something that we must be using because it's it's on the front sign. I think linking technology with a broader educational push at the school is really important because it's easy to dismiss technology as as something that you know it'd be nice to do if we had time. Sure, and uh, I'll hand the microphone over to Simon now. But I'd be curious to hear about what what the pro problems were like with your netbook program um, previously, and why some of the kids are quite negative about it. But uh, Simon, would you like to take the mic, please? Yep, just a quick question. You commented that you were teaching to a low socio-economic group. Um, presumably, low engagement, low literacy. Um, in a nutshell, how have they responded to this type of program? Um, I think it varies. I don't think we're hitting all the students at the moment. I think some of the students are are disengaged for different reasons uh, that are unrelated to um, technology or um, the, the work being tailored to their point of need. Uh, in general, I think the the responses have been positive, but they've required some pushing. So I think the students need to see that, that it's actually going to happen. And I need, because they're a bit older as well, um, I'm now dealing with um, kids who are sort of 13, 14, and you need to actually go up and say, look, you'd be really good at this. I think also, if you look at these things as something, like if you look at that science program and say, well, that, that's going to be good for all my students, I, I think that's the wrong approach to take. I see personalised learning as providing different opportunities for the students who want it. So, you know, for maybe two thirds of my students, they're not going to get anything out of having their writing read around the world, or they're not going to get anything out of uh, working with scientists online. But for the third that are, I think it's fantastic. It, it, we need to look after those students who would really flourish with the right opportunities and sometimes I think we focus on the students who um, uh, who need more assistance who are at the uh, we don't extend students very well at the, at the upper end and so this is one way that we're extending the upper end students uh, in terms of how we locate the virtual experts and the mentors uh, basically just a lot of hard work a lot of self promotion I used to be a scientist which means that um, I've got a lot of links there. Um, we did some work with this at Castlemaine North, and that ended up as an article in Australian Teacher Magazine, and so that generated a lot of um, goodwill and a lot of excitement. So we've still got a few uh, scientists from from that era. Um, some of them are personal contacts. So I showed you um, I showed you Jeffrey Hosford, who was the biomechanist who's written the book about the science of kicking. He also happens to be my uncle. <laughs> um, there was Chris Armashaw, who is the uh, the scientist in 
um, in Florida. He's also a friend of mine and I used to live with him when we did our PhD together in Brisbane. So uh, yeah, personal contacts are really good. Anyway, you can get the contacts, but um, you know, we're happy to share and we're happy to build with other schools. So uh, yeah, we it's, it's just basically hard work. Just keep pushing, keep trying. You realise that not everyone you get on board is actually going to to be to be able to contribute in the way that you want to. But if you keep trying and keep pushing, you get there. Um, the CSIRO, I should say, um, the way this started was that we had uh, we enrolled in the scientists and schools program, and we said, look, we don't want anyone to come up to Castlemaine. Um, we would prefer that they just work online with our students because if they came up to Castlemaine, you know, it's an hour and a half on the train, it's been a couple of hours at the school, then an hour and a half back, you know, it, by the end of the day it'll be like six hours of work. We prefer that that six hours is spread in 10 or 15 minute chunks throughout the, um, the school year because once they leave the school, once they've done their visit, that's it. The students don't have a way to follow up and contact them later on down the track. So um, it works for the scientists as well. The feedback that we've got is that you know they can they can sort of check their messages and comment on blogs in the five or ten minutes that they've got downtime between experiments and things like that. So it works better for them. It works better for us. Um, Rob, I wonder, and Simon, I wonder whether there would be an opportunity for uh, scientists to be connected through science works. Uh, do you have? Uh, scientists who volunteer and um, help out with the kids at ScienceWorks. Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Look, places like so. Look, I think the answer to that is not so much the scientists at ScienceWorks because ScienceWorks, you know, a cultural institute. It's basically a museum, and we have a whole range of um, expertises. Uh, or experts working in a, such a place like that. Where my, my mind is going is, you know, so you contacted scientists, you're blogging. Another venue that teachers are not used to going to are cultural institutions that we have in Australia, such as the museum, immigration museum, science works, and you can make contact with curators, um, you know, even customer service people, uh, scientists, um, a range of experts in their field that really using a program like this you can make contact with. Um, and certainly a place like the Museum or ScienceWorks, um, you could certainly plug into specialists of a variety of um, fields in a place like that. Now where um, cultural institutions, institutions are now going, is they need to, or places like the Melbourne Museum anyway, they need to be engaged in curriculum and they will be supporting uh, the Australian curriculum. So you will have people on board that are ready to make contact with schools. Okay, hope that helps. Thanks, Simon. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but that was a, a good answer. Thanks. Uh, now, look, I'm mindful of the time. It is after nine. But, uh, Rob, did you want to come back there? I, I see you have something to say. Yeah, I should say at Castlemaine North we extended the idea. It wasn't just about um, science experts. that we, um, we tried to get history experts and it was just really, really difficult. I think I emailed every museum in Australia to try and get people who were willing to help our students and we've just had more success with scientists. I don't know whether I, I'm biased because I used to be one but I think the scientists, there's a lot of scientists out there who are really passionate about inspiring students and, and happy to work electronically and, and we've had, we have tried with other um, kinds of virtual experts but the, the scientists have always been the best. And it, yeah, it is, quite, it is quite possible that we didn't have the personal connection but even, you know, even the frequency which, with, which um, people would, or scientists would get onto the blogs and, and comment on them was always higher for the scientists. That's interesting. Simon, I, um, I mean Rob, just another question for you about contacting people outside of the school. It's more a, a, a safety, security, dash duty of care type question. Do you have to um, um, sort of vet these teachers before you allow them to speak to the students? Is, is there any um, 
code of, of practice that you have to follow with that because if you're having a, a guest speaker into the school they'd have to go through all that sort of process. So is it the same kind of thing when you, you're getting ch children to speak with adults online? Um, I'm not sure, but we certainly do take a lot of precautions. Uh, all of the scientists uh, have working with children's checks. Uh, the contact that's mediated via the blog, so on our blogging site, um, the students can send, can interact through forums, public and private messages, and through comments on their blogs. The way I've set them up is that every interaction goes through me, so that I see all the interactions that occur between any parties on, on the blog. Uh, in addition, the students don't have their own Skype account. It has to happen through my computer. So my computer sort of sits in the room and it's kind of like, if you can imagine it, like it's like a telephone. So that they don't have their own Skype account. The, I have a central Skype account that, the, uh, that I mediate that contact through. So the students say, can I Skype in the team? Yep, that's fine. Um, but you know, it can't happen outside of ours because I've, I've got the Skype account that connects everybody together. So yeah, we, we have thought about making sure everything's above board and the fact that they've got working with children's checks, the fact that I see all the interactions, the fact that I've got the Skype account um, is, I think, um, you know, covering our bases. Uh, different time zones can be a problem. Um, we've only got one of our virtual scientists who's outside of Australia at the moment, so that's not a big issue at the moment. But uh, part of what we're trying to teach students is not just uh, to be inspired by scientists and, and to learn about what they do and, and to learn about um, scientific method, but for them to also understand that in 2013 uh, you can learn from and work with people who are physically distant from yourself. So I think that's another important issue that I want to get across to the students that you know you you don't have to rely on people who are in a physical close physical proximity to yourself. Well, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful presentation. Now, before I stop the recording, just wondering if anyone has a final comment or question for Ross. Okay, well, I'm sure there'll be um, many things that people would like to talk to you about in the future, and I'm certainly keen to have you back, Rob, to come and chat to us as the year progresses, because I'm, I'm really keen to know how these projects are going to work in middle school, you know, take it up to year 8s, 9s and 10s where the engagement, uh, the disengagement with learning tends to be at its greatest. So I'd be really looking forward to hearing about how it goes there. So look, I want to thank you very, very much for coming on board and, and sharing with us your experience and your project. I'm certainly inspired and, and I'm sure other people are here too. Now this recording will be available straight away and I will post the link on uh, the Australia Series blog and on Facebook. Now we do have a final uh, hands up. Now who's got their hand up? I can't see. Sorry, or that must have been a clapping hand. So maybe we could give Rob a uh, round of applause if you'd just like to grab the the smiley face icon under the participants window and we'll give Rob a round of applause for um, sharing with us such a great session tonight. So thank you very much for coming along. A final word from you Rob? Once again thank you very much for the uh, for inviting me Penny and thank you to all the um, all the um, listeners to the presentation. I hope it made sense. I know it's, it's quite a lot to sort of take in. Um, particularly wanted to thank the, um, the two teachers from Crusoe College for showing support and also Simone from Castlemaine North who um, uh, without this, would none of this would exist. So thank you very much. Thanks again.